obviously be on TikTok or social media, but um, about a month ago I came on to the Greenwich Podcast and they thought it would be beneficial for me to come and speak to you guys today. Actually, about 15 years ago, I was sat exactly where you are. So today I'm going to like share my journey on from leaving university where I got to. And I'm actually going to take you before university as well. Because I believe it's all about habits, you know, and the habits you create and how you can implement them into your life, you know. And uh, let me just first of all just say thank you for everybody that's here today. It's the greatest thing you can give anybody is your time. Um, I thought we'd start with one of our TikToks because this one we 1.8 million views um, and it pretty much summarised up what I sort of done in my whole life so you can you'll get an idea of what to expect um, what we're going to be speaking about today and it was actually um, a guy called Carl Carl Pilkington. he does um, Idiot Abroad on Channel 4 he's the one who actually got me on the live and was like hey so man who are you so I explained to him who I am and I thought let me repost this and um, yeah, it really blew off the TikTok channel. Daniela, we can play this. I did not make my money. Well, basically, I worked in my dad's corner shop, so I started learning VATs and markups from a very young age. By 13, I worked in a cash and carry, so on the weekends when I was at school or summer holidays. And um, as soon as I got into college, I did three days of college and four days of McDonald's. Um, I paid for my university, it was only a thousand pounds back then. Um, as soon as I graduated, I worked five days in Barclays as just a normal cashier. And Saturday and Sunday, I worked at McDonald's and I started planning away the savings. And within the first year, I saved a thousand pounds a month and twelve thousand pounds, and I had ten percent deposit on a house that was one hundred forty thousand. And um, I opened up a separate account, started saving money into that account. I got promoted in my job. Within two and a half years, I was seventy thousand in the bank, half a million years in there. Still work on eight nine pounds an hour with McDonald's, so I will really go out as much or be spending as much while I'm working. I was associated with my friends at work and things like that. And then for my second, third, fourth, by 26, I left the bank, but I had four or five properties already. Um, and still not living that lifestyle of somebody who's only, you know, having bread on four properties. Became a builder, started with my own extensions, my property value went, you know, quite high. And I just took some of the money out, like 100 grand from a few properties, and put it as a deposit on more houses. And um, yeah, that was from 26 down to 36. You make your money, right? I did not make my money. Well, there you go, there's a journey, guys. Um, there's one thing you can probably take away from that is you don't have to just have one career or one thing that you're doing in your life, you can reinvent yourself as many times as you want. And wherever you are in life, just always make sure like the skills you can take away from each job. It doesn't matter if your boss is not being the best to you or you don't can appreciate it. Always think to yourself, what am I getting from this? What can I learn from you right now? Who do I want to be around? Who are you know some of the best people around me? Because later on you can implement that into your business. If you're gonna be in a job and you're gonna say, I'm gonna do the bare minimum, I'm gonna be the last one in first one out, can't wait to do my own thing. And these are the ethics and habits you're going to take away and implement in your own business one day. So always have that little thought in your head. So I made a quick PowerPoint up for you guys to see. So I just wanted to share a little bit of my story. There's me, like, as I said, from the age of eight, I used to work in my dad's shop. There's me actually sharing my dad's clothes on a school trip. That school trip, I remember, um, I, I wasn't even allowed to go. Like, my parents straight away said, you've got enough money for that, Sean, you, you, you can't go. And I'm like, oh, I really want to go where my friends are going. And uh, the teachers all knew that I wanted to go, and then somebody dropped out and they go, sure, you can come to Paris with us and, uh, for the day trip, and I was like, no, no, I really can't, we've got enough money, and they go, no, no, it's all covered. So then the, the, the second thing was like, hey, I don't even have any nice clothes <laughs> right now, my dad goes, yeah, take my awesome. And I don't even think that was real, <laughs> that was a movie one. 
Um, and as you can see, my dad always used to cut my hair for me when I was young. So I just want to show you a little bit of a journey that even starting from nothing, you can definitely get to wherever you want to be. You are always the driving, you're, you are always in the driving seat. You drive that car as fast as you want, as slow as you want, you can take a left turn or a right turn. You are always in, you know, you've got the key to your destiny in your own hands. So anyone says, oh, you're lucky, you came from money, money makes money, hey, hang on. It isn't that way. And today I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. And you're not even going to be amazed. And I, that, that's not even... That's not even a bad thing because you might say, hey Sean, that, that story wasn't as, you know, it wasn't like winning the lottery and, and getting there just in a minute. But if I can put that belief in you that, hey, Sean can do it, why can't I do it? Then my job is done. Um, and obviously today, this is one of my proudest achievements, like um, sitting down with Samuel Leeds, he's got over 400,000 subscribers on YouTube. One morning I woke up, a little bit of blue tick verified, Hey Sean, inspiring story. And I was like, hey, I've followed this guy for five years. Why has he messaged me on social media? And I was like, so I'm not going to let this guy go. I said, yes, yeah, so when you come on the podcast? And he, was, and he was just like, what podcast? We had that conversation, and a week later, I was around his house with my cameraman. And that's it, we just recorded, and things spiraled from there. So if you watch the podcast now, you can see there's at least six you know, top um, guys at nine of my podcasts. Um, and this Friday, I've got another top guest as well, and other people are starting to reply. So, this is one journey I can definitely show you that, look, Sean started 12 months ago in January. He's already been on BBC Radio. He's been on um, one of his properties, he's been on ITV to conversate with the best people. I'm just showing you exactly. I'm at the bottom of my mountain. Nobody knows me. You know Sean Lang. But today, you're going to be able to see him. Hey, last year he was at a uni. Already there's schools that are like, yeah, in Brentwood, they're like, yeah, that's Sean Lang. He came to our school already, so we're already building that track. And then I'm sure in the next two, three years, the whole UK will know about you know what we're doing and how, how we're trying to get back. So if there's something you can take away, it's, yeah, let's see if the, the proof in the pudding is in the eating. So let's see if he's actually got it because he can tell any story he wants to. So you're thinking, this guy must be really clever, right? He must be winning every single award in school. Well, actually, I wasn't the most cleverest person um, in the room. But one, uh, one or two certificates I'd always get, and that's one I'd always come home to show mom and dad, hey, I've got two awards, and that, what's that? It'd always be punctuality, and it's always be attendance. And I'm thinking, well, did that really make a difference? But Sometimes you just got to be there, just like you guys are today. Because you, instead of going home or to the student bar or student union place, you decided to come here today. Maybe that could be the one thing that makes a difference. Sometimes you just got to be present. You just got to be there. And that's one lesson I was took away. Even Wood Adams once said that 80% of success in life is just showing up. So yeah, um, my journey started from the age of eight. Um, my mum was a housewife, and my dad um, always was at the family business. My granddad came in the 1960s, uh, and basically he used to spray cars and Fords, and he used to do door-to-door -door selling. And I always saw dad in the shop. Once they had enough money, my dad and his three brothers, all the, all, they, um, they put all of their money in and bought this corner shop. And everybody done a shit in the corner shop. So my mindset was always, hey, like, the man is supposed to work seven days a week, morning, night. So there was no boundaries. First of all, I took every single boundary away. Um, we could never afford a babysitter, so when my dad had to go somewhere with my granddad, my mom would cover a shift in the shop, and I would always be with, with my mom, like the man, the car in the shop, you know? Um, and it was as simple as running for some salt powder, uh, pricing out with the price guy from the age of eight. But by 10, 11, I started working at BATs, markups. So I was like, all right, so my dad was giving the invoice and he got shown, BAT is 20%, that's how to do that. And then we have to earn 35% on this. Oh, and how many products in this in this box? Eight, why do I eight? So I started learning BATs and markup at a very young age. So 
it wasn't sort of any barrier. I started learning like accounting practices such as life or by or first in, first out, stock rotation. Um, so that was the beginning of sort of my my working experience. Well, you, you helped her and it's part of your job anyway. I was like, I've got it. that's part of my job. I get three pounds an hour, I do ten hours, I get thirty quid. I help eight people get five pounds, I get forty quid. I'm gonna start doing that. So when sometimes you think I'm not getting anything back from from doing more from my job, that's one way that I learned and I started very right so this paper and stuff. And this guy is wow. <laughs> I can do what I want with this. So, you know, I want to have learned that so I went in that cash and carry, you know, at the age of 13. So it's all about the quicker you start earning money, the quicker you start getting some sort of experience, the quicker you're getting ready for life because sometimes we are gonna make mistakes and mistakes are okay and failures are also okay. But the quicker we make these failures, the quicker we understand how to overcome it because failure isn't the end, it's just how do I keep going? Like, what did I learn from this? How do I do it better next time? So, um, it was still like, you know, 13 to 16, I was doing this cash and carry job on the weekends, and during summer holidays, we get six weeks off, so I do five o'clock in the morning, five in the evening. We used to go in the truck, and there used to be a bed above. Above the truck, so when we were going to burn jobs, I was like, hey, I get paid you know, for three hours for sleeping, so I'm gonna go and do them sort of jobs. But then it came to a period where I started college, and Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, I was at college, and I was like, hang on, I've got Tuesday and Thursday and the weekends free. And I thought, do you know what? I really want to get my own job. My dad got me that job. It still wasn't me, you know, my dad got me that job, and I just went to be independent, like that. I applied for a job myself and I got it myself. So anyway, I was applying everywhere, no one would answer, and I walked into McDonald's and I went to the lady and I went, um, can I give you my CV for, um, I'm going to apply for a job? And she goes, sorry, I don't think we've got any jobs. And I went, ah, oh, okay. Um, do you mind if I speak to your manager for a second? Um, she goes, yeah, I can get him for you. And she got him and I went, oh, hi, I'm, I'm Sean. Um, I'm really looking for a job, I can do anything you want. Like, I really got some work experience and that's it. He was like, are you free in an hour? I was like, yeah. So I went to this retail park, came in an hour, sat down, done my interview, got, got the job. Like, not not got the job solidly, but I got my trial sheet. So I've never taken no over an answer. I've always tried to make that extra step. And then on my first day, we straight on uh, the, the, the grill side. So I started putting ketchup, mustard, this, 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 this. And I, I just started getting confused. I just didn't know what to do. I was like, and they were like, get him off, get him off. He's slowing down the whole production, and I was all red to my face with my little sweaty hat on. And uh, they go, yeah, you, you're free to go home if you want. Yeah, and I was like, I was like, oh, how am I gonna tell my parents? Like, you know, I'm going home. I got sacked straight away. So I was like, I said, please, please give me. I, I'm sure I'm, I know I'm better than this. I, I really know I'm better than this. Can I, can I, can I, can I show you? And they were like, oh, I'm working on chicken side, letting the nuggets out. So the whole day. I used to Open the side chiller, open up these nuggets, put it in a basket, put it down, 3 minutes 30 seconds, still remember it, and then put it on the uh, sort of basket, and then just used to put three nuggets, wrap them up, and that was my job for about like, 6 hours that day. They sat me down, they were like, hey, you're not the best, but we can see that you didn't want to give up, etc. So I was like, alright, I'm still not going to give up, I'm, I'm willing to do the job, whatever you want me to do. It took me 3 months to start training other people. So just by not giving up, just every day, what can you teach me? It was just too fast for me, can you teach me again? Let me do it in my own pace, right, I've got it. And then I just took speed with it. Once you know what you're doing on a process, just start adding speed to it, that's it, simple. So um, after three months, I um, started training other people. I wanted to learn the till. So I went, can I learn the till please? And uh, they were like, sorry, it's all about labor. So we've got enough money to teach you on the till, we've got enough girls at the front, you're staying in the kitchen. So I was like, I'm at the till, I really want to learn that till. It looks really complicated, all the buttons. So I was like, you know, we've got 45 minutes on the break. Um, is it alright if I work on my break? And they were like, is he mad? I was like, I was like yeah, like, it only takes me 15 minutes to eat. And they were like, yeah, if you want to. Hey, we've got free labour for half an hour, let him do all the stuff at the front. Took me three shifts, totally learned the till. One time, I finished chicken side. Going on, they're like, yeah, Lucy ain't turned up. She ain't turned up for a shift. What are we going to do? We want to short. 
I was like, I know till. That's it. Got another four hours added onto my shift. And do you know what? It wasn't like heavy lifting baskets and all these buns, steaming, eating, all this dressing, all of this sort of stuff. It was. I don't for my fillet. It's coming. Cool. Open the bag. Boom. Boom. My job is so easy now, and I'm getting paid for this. Like, I just saw what was the easiest job. Again, as I told you, I'm lazy. I just always said, where's the easiest place to be? And that was at the front. And then I thought, the, all the managers do is just stand around. The manager says, how many tools have I got on? Send her on break. Put a little couple of uh, numbers in the, in the computer. How many people have I got in the kitchen? Occasionally, if they want to do a bit of exercise, they will jump in and, and help out at busy periods. And I'm just like, I don't want to be that guy. And that's what I did. Within 12 months, I was a manager. And that's what it took. It was just like, hey, I've got five months. Oh, I've just started university, we've got a long period off. Can I do the management exams? I'm like, sure, so if that's what you want. The first aid, um, sort of. It was just like, what can I learn right now while I'm still doing university? And at the same time, I was earning money. By 17, I'll pass my driving test, I'll pay for my first insurance. I was like, yeah, I want to take care of myself. I don't want to ask anything of my parents. I'm 16, so onwards up. Never asked a single penny. I'm by myself. Mum, if you need anything, I've got you. You know? So I graduated from uh, University of Greenwich, got a counseling and finance degree. And um, luckily, that year it was 2008. And a lot of my friends actually were unemployed for the next three years. I applied six months before to the bank to say, it's going to take some time uh, to get through some interview process. And 2008 was a financial crash. So I know that everybody got quiet back then. So because I've already got my leg in the door, I had a mass test in um, February. Um, in uh, May, I had another interview. And then they actually told me to start in July. And I was like, look, I'll graduate this month. They were like, well, give me that day off. You can just start before then. I said, sure, let's start. So I was like, now I have to replace uni Monday to Friday with my Monday to Friday job, which is Barclays. But guess what? I kept my Saturday and Sunday job at McDonald's. I used to do 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock on a Saturday and Sunday, and Monday to Friday I used to do my cashiering job. And I was like, I'm going to do this because I get £100 Saturday and I get £100 Sunday. At the end of the month, that's £800. I can survive on that. And whatever I learn in my full time job, I'm going to put that away because I'm going to buy something with that. I finally got some real money. So I um, started off as a cashier. One of my first things that I asked um, before the three months probation finished, they said, Do you have any? We're going to give you a proper contract. Do you have any questions for us? I said, Yeah, what's the next role? And they looked at me like, Sorry, you just stopped, you just passed your probation. And now you've got a fixed contract. I said, Yeah, what's the next role? And they were like, You can take it to a system manager or you can take it to a personal banker, but you need to get through cashiering first. And you've got to do your time 18 months. But the lesson you've got to take away is you got to always know where you're going. If you're working in a role, I'm not here to sit here just for the fun of it. And even then, I had to like retrain myself. Like so, even working in a shop, you're like, alright, darling, right, sweetheart, yeah, that's two ninety nine, please. So when I was in the bank, I was like, you know, just like, there you go, darling. Like, sure, sure, we need a word with you. Because they, they used to be like, I can't speak for a customer, man, it's a sir or madam. And then one time they were like, what's wrong with your leg? And I was like, my leg? What's wrong with my leg? And they're like, yeah, why are you walking like that? And I was actually walking like this, because I could be slumping like, <laughs> like in my suit, walking around. And they were like, I can't do none of that. You need to even walk properly. And so I was like, all right, so I need to, you know. So you just got to, we, all we ever are in life, we're just actors. I'm acting to be a speaker right now. I'm a speaker. It's one of the first times I've spoken in front of you guys. I'm not a speaker, but I'm acting to be a speaker. We just say, this is my role. This is what... The task is in front of me, and let me just act to be that person. Anyway, I was a cashier, 18 months it was supposed to take. Again, six months, Rising Star Academy, get shown on. Because they said, I said, what's my targets per week? They go, you need to get leads. So what's a lead? And they go, you need to go on someone's profile, check their direct debit, largest one is a mortgage. If they've got a higher balance, it means we can do some savings for them. We can sell them other products or match better products to them. So I was looking at it, I was like, Okay, so what's the target? It said 10 a week. So again, yeah, I said, yeah, I'm going to get 10 a day. And that's exactly what I did, because all I had to do was buy my lottery tickets. Every customer was a lottery ticket, so I spoke to every single customer. And even just some of them, I didn't even see any opportunity, and I went, when was the last time you had a financial review? And a lot of them were like, oh, I never had one of them. 
break, they would get you sat down. And sometimes even the personal banker would, would, would spot a need because I wasn't trained to that level. So after six months of going to the Rising Star Academy, I done another PowerPoint presentation. This was all of the managers in West End. Before long, I was coordinated after four months after that. Um, it's supposed to be 18 months after four months straight onto the personal banking desk. Of course, I took a dip, like the McDonald job. I didn't know what I was doing, and so much paperwork. And they were like, Are you sure personal banking is right for you? I said, Yeah, let me just learn everything after two months. Within 12 months, number one in West End. And then, of course, you had to do your 18 months, but no, there's this guy called Richard Fuggle, uh, APM, Area Performance Manager, came in and goes, Sean, leave your desk right now, you coming with me? I was like, Yeah. Need to offer you a good uh, proposition. I want to look after the millionaires in this area. Uh, it's, it's a premier manager role. You'll only have 200 clients to look after, and you are just their personal manager. And I was like, Yeah, but what about all these customers that I'm looking after right now? It's all taken care of, so I'm going to take over you. So I was like, oh, I really want to be a financial advisor, and he's making me a premier manager. So I spoke to one of my managers at the time, and he just said, Look, you're a B3 now, this is a B5 role. You know, and a, and, a, and a financial advisor, that role isn't here right now, but it's another B5 role. If you get to that stage, it's always a chance for you to move sideways. And, and you'll get even better skills, you can't more courses, because, you know, Barclays will train you up. Yeah. So, whatever you do in life, <laughs> just be the best at it. I knew I was never going to be always a cashier or a banker or you know, someone just helping them with their party card, but I was there right now, and I was there to do a duty and a job. And I've got, you know, communication skills there. I, 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 I learned problem solving. I learned how to work as a team, and the queue was so long that there's only two cashiers on. I was like, hey, I'm not a cashier. I'm gonna get behind and give you guys a hand and be a team player. So just always be the best you can be wherever you are. And uh, yeah, so that thing I told you about, Saturday, Sunday, working in McDonald's, and uh, Monday to Friday working in banking, well, I used to earn £1,300 and then £1,600 at the bank a month, but let's just say I put £1,000 away, first year, 12 months, £12,000, the mortgage advisor said he's selling his property in Dagenham, it's quite local to me, that area, so how much do you want, he said £160,000. So it's 160,000. I said, no, I can't afford that. He done his number. He goes, you can afford 140. I said, yeah, maybe if I could, if you were willing to take 140, I'll buy it. He goes, I'm desperate. Ah, uh, the financial crash is happening right now. My loan is only 100 grand, so I've got 40 grand that I need for my next property. I said, well, I've got a cap of, you know, 120, um, 12,000, and that's all I needed was a 10 percent deposit, 14,000. So I took 5,000 from a credit card and I bought my first house. So you know. Had I not started saving from a young age, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. So some people can say, you got lucky, and oh yeah, the house prices were cheap then as well, but I could have easily been unemployed with like my friends, or be spending my money on material items. Remember, always use your money to make more money. Make your money pregnant. That's what you've got to think about. Not just throw it because on a material item, you spend it on things you don't need, to get certain confidence, oh, I need Stone Island, I need uh, Gucci, I need this. And yeah, people say, yeah, you look nice to me, yeah, he's rich. And then tomorrow, these guys won't be there anymore. And you're thinking, who was I really trying to impress? Confidence comes from within who you are. And the good people will always be around you because of the person you are. They don't care what you've got on or what you're driving or who you know. They're just there because <laughs> they like you. So always take that sort of away from you. Um, but yeah, I, uh, as I said, I was still doing parkies and I was the best and I was climbing the ranks. Evenings, I used to try to do a little bit of work here on weekends and employ builders and, and get builders to do some work for me. Um, and yeah, by the age of 26, I had four properties. They were all worth more than 250,000 and on paper I became a millionaire. Just like that, small little habits. Small little jobs like people in the back would say, What are you doing on the weekend, Sean? I was like, Well, I'm doing an 8 to 4 at McDonald's. Like, You're fucking crazy, you are. I ain't getting up to 12 o'clock in the afternoon. And the next minute, uh, uh, Jane had just bought my house. How did you do that? That job that you said, 
It's just a small little habit, right? I don't know if you've read Atomic Habits or Think and Grow Rich. They just tell you about small habits over time compounded just leads to these sort of results. And that's the real life. The real life is you have to keep going. There's no one there to say, come on, get off of work, come on, let's do this. It's just you and your own head. And you're going to say, oh, I've got a goal. Why am I waking up today? Because I want to buy another house. Because I want to be financially free. Because I actually want to be retired in my 30s. You can, if you want to. You've got to make it happen. No one's going to make it happen for you. And yeah, so 26 came and uh, I employed a builder for one of my properties and guess what? As builders do, they don't finish your project. And I was like, um, come on bro, please get this done, you've done the walls, you've turned down the roof. And he goes to me, yeah, I need 4,000 pounds more now, you've got off budget. I'm like, alright, so here you go. He thought I went checking, but I go every night after work, climb up the scaffolding, check, and I'm like, there's no roof on here still, I've just given him four grand for the roof, it's been two weeks. So I'm like, what's, been, what's going on bro? And he goes, yeah we went, um, it's just taking a little bit longer, I said, you haven't been there. And I was like, it doesn't end up being, you need to leave, honestly, you need to leave. You've taken money twice on me, five, six grand, you haven't done anything. So um, I told work, I said, look, I need a couple of months off. And they're like, really? I was like, I really need it off. And they were like, okay, that's fine, we'll give you some time off, you can come back at any stage. And so I got moved into this project and I saw the builder, Imran, and he goes, uh, the builder has paid me. I said, look, I've been paying the builder, I don't know what's going on between these two, do you want to work for me? And he said, yeah, I want to get paid. I said, well, you know what's going on in this house. What, what do you need? He said, well, I've got some tools, but I might need more tools and I need a labourer. I said, all right, cool, labourer's here, what do you want me to do? And so I'm like, you know, I learned everything. Four buckets of sand, half a cement, put a bit of liquid dye that, that's sand cement done. Uh, he wanted to lay the flooring. Normally it takes you only lay one flooring, uh, uh, one room's flooring in the day. We used to do two and a half. So what do you want me to do? He goes, yeah, take all of the boxes, all of the laminate floors out, use the chop saw like this, and use the angle, uh, angle saw like this, etc. And that's what I did. And then Guess what? I ended up doing that for the next six years. I got another six by six meter extension. And guess what? While I was in McDonald's, this lady came up to me and she goes, Hey Sean, you told me you're a builder now, ain't you? I said, Yeah. She goes, I'm a real good designer. Um, she's looking for a builder. She's got someone to do the design in the zinc coping and black cladding and door to door windows and all this sort of stuff. And I was like, I never even heard about it. I know I to put a wall up and get, get a bunch of builders together. So I was like, yeah, I'll meet her. So I went into this big designer office and she used to do cathedrals in France and stuff. And she goes, yeah, I'm looking for a builder. This lady, Holly Cook, she's, uh, she works for the BBC and we need to do this extension for her. No builder would touch it. And I knew, I found out after, because it wasn't made out of brick, it was made out of waterproof plywood. And you had to find a way to pick it up and bolt it right down. It was like a proper different construction, but Again, we got through it. <laughs> I just said to my builder, what do you need? Let's get in the box, let's do it. Um, so we've done some really nice showcasing sort of jobs. That job has actually paid about £80,000, you know, and put it done in about 30000 so there was a lot of money in there. Got some more money, put it down in more houses. The house that I bought for 140000 at the start is now 300000 went to the bank. It's worth well, three hundred, so they took the percentage and went, yeah, we can give you 50000 more. My second house, I bought for 108,000 in Stratford, went up to 500,000. I was like, can I have some money? They said, you can have 150,000 if you want. You've got enough rent covering this. Took out 150,000, put it on another house, put it on another house after that. Any maintenance or building work, I knew how to do it. So uh, an extension would only cost you 150,000. Just because I was coordinating the builders myself, I need the main builder there, I need a plaster there, I need a Bricky this, oh, this is when I do the plumbing, this is when I do electrics, it's all there on the plan. If you're interested, you can do it. I had a van from my dad's shop, I said, Dad, I brought in the van, I used to stick the two by four timber in there, pick the uh, sand and cement, you start learning, you know, who the uh, building merchants are around the area, start building good relationships again, and just used all of the skills that I had of, you know, I can work seven days a week if it has to be. I can use my main builder, I can use another builder on the weekend if he doesn't want to work. You know, all of these skills come in handy real later. And 
you, you can say, look, I learned a little bit of property from my parents, seeing them sort of starting to invest in the, in the late 90s. I learned in the bank how to <laughs> get loans and how the mortgage structures worked. I learned how to be a builder. So when I walk into a, a place right now, I go, right. So I know the, the market, I know what, as an estate agent, I know exactly what the house values are, how much it rents for, there's a bit of doubt there, I know as a builder's hand, 15 minutes I can make, just if I want it or not. And that's enough sometimes to get the deals, because some, sometimes somebody will come, oh, this is a nice house, it needs a bit of work there, it needs a bit of work there. I'll come in three days because my builder's free then, then I'll come then, and then by right that time you've lost the deal. So it's all about, you know, uh, be an expert in your field, whatever field you want to get into, try and learn a little bit of everything. You don't have to know everything amazingly, you just got to know how it sort of works. Yes, and uh, as you can see, once I get to the top of my mountain, now I'm not saying I've got a hundred million pound portfolio, you know, I've got around about a ten billion pound property portfolio right now, um, but I'm, I'm financially secure, I've got a nice big house, I've got nice cars, and got enough money, like everything's good, like money doesn't make a difference, the way I've structured my companies now, money comes and it's like if another thousand pounds come, it's very hard to even bring it out to yourself because the amount of taxes you pay, so how you grow your sort of company, so um, money is not my main driver, so all I ever wanted to be was financially free, I just wanted to say, you know, I never have to ask my mom and dad for money, um, I didn't start, I remember I was that little boy in the in the shop, sharing dad's clothes, home haircuts. And so I'm like, now I'm like, what makes me happy? So along my journey, I've helped a lot of my friends. And, um, you know, they, they basically, uh, someone very close to me came to the country um, 15 years ago. He now has two million pounds worth of property and a business that turns over 30,000 pounds a month. And yeah, I'm happy to say that I contributed. I told him, yeah, if you work in that cash and carry, start doing that, start doing that course. Once you do that course, I'll introduce you to an estate agent who needs all of these, and he's got 150 clients, 300 clients, and we can make that happen. As soon as he had a little bit of money and how he saved, I was like, go and buy that house. Let me introduce you to my mortgage guy who will be able to do that, and then he benefited from his house going up also, and uh, he able to take that 50,000. Someone who's just come from a different country sort of basically replicated what I've sort of done. So it's not impossible. I've had a tenant who's rented a room off me, Pizza. He's from Czech Republic, and we kept bumping the, into each other um, in the gym. He's like, hey man, how's it going, yo? I'm like, yo, Peter, what's going on? And I, I was a big believer, like, don't mix, don't mix business and pleasure. Never, never mix the two. But he was just so adamant. He's like, hey, you're an amazing guy. Like, can we train together sometime? I was like, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll do it, we'll do it. He goes, yeah, so next Thursday. I was like, yeah, I am actually free. And he's like, yeah, let's train. So. Anyway, we brought that barrier, we ended up still being good friends. And um, I was like, I really want to see Czech Republic. Well, I'll take you sometime. He goes, Yeah, I'm going next week. Let's, uh, let's go. And I was like, Yeah, let's go then. So I've actually been Czech Republic seven times now and met his family and stuff. And um, yeah, there was this one train journey. He asked me a few questions. And um, yeah, I just answered it very simply. And then 10 months later, he goes, Hey man, I want to show you something. And I was like, What are you going to show me? He showed me his back there. I saved 12,000 pounds, man. I said, like, that's amazing. I said, like, how did you do that? And he goes, well, I'm just a waiter in Las Iguanas, yo. But I was getting some tips here and my main income from here. And you just showed me what to do with it. And that's exactly what I did. And I was like, oh, oh, did I? And he goes, yeah, that's exactly what you said. I followed it and I've got 12,000. I'm going back to Czech Republic now. I'm buying a house there. I'm like, oh, wow. He goes, I'm telling you, man, you have a gift. You have a gift, man. You're special. And I was like, I'm special. This is where I've come from. I've only done this because no, no one does this stuff. So um, the fact of giving gives you a totally different feeling than earning that next pound once you get to a certain level. So I, I was like, look, I was always that kid who was a little bit lost, got bullied in school, being fat, never a nobody, worked in McDonald's like all your friends are in retail and next and in the, in the better jobs. But hang on. I am a someone now, I'm happy, I'm, I'm confident within myself. So how do I sort of feel good now? How do I find a will to get up in the morning? Because when you have everything, that's also a lonely place to when, you, when you're in poverty as well. 
when you have everything, what, what are you working towards? All your friends are at work, 9 to 5, I'm 36 now, you know, I wake up, I was like, you know what we have to do, I'm like, what? Okay, so, who's around? No one. So, it's like, what do I do now? So, every time I climb to the top of my mountain, I always come down to the bottom and now I'm starting my influencing journey. So, you know, there's another person on my uh, podcast, uh, Ricky Marley, he's a really successful uh, entrepreneur in real estate. I went on the Sonia Bada show with um, uh, BBC Asian Network Radio, the Brit Asia, call me up. You know, now today I'm talking to you. I'm like, 15 years ago, I was on sat where you were sitting. And now I'm talking to you guys and sort of giving back. I'll go into schools in Essex and this is making me feel good. And I'm like, you know, we've got nearly 25,000 followers on TikTok now. Some rules have hit 1.8 million. Instagram's coming up, the long form on YouTube. But hey, it's a journey right now. You know, there's, there's one of my guys up there who's filming. You know, um, he's even showing me how to do rules. He's showing me how to edit right now. And I'm like, you never stop learning. He's like, what you got to do, Sean? Put this here, put a little blur on here, and this will capture the magic. I love it. It's just every day you're getting up to learn, and you never stop learning. So as long as I can keep helping and giving, that's the best thing you can do in life. But you've got to get in that position, and that's what we're just trying to do right now. Just you know, grow the following. That's it. That's the end of the presentation, guys. But you can follow us on uh, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, uh, and it's actually shortland.co.uk. Yeah, not NSL app. That's a sort of difference. But yeah, make all you can do. If there's anything you can do to help support, and if you've appreciated this, is just follow the handles. There's a lot of free content, you know. So when you, when you're as you're coming up, always use as much free content before you pay anything. You know, because sometimes not everybody, what I've noticed, not everybody in this influencing stage has done that much. They've read one book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then they think they can teach you about habits and small habits will make big differences. They've never done it themselves. So when you're looking at an influencer to follow, have a look at what he's achieved in his life. What has he done? What can I learn of him that he's done it? Because it's like going, Somebody else fell down and you felt their pain and said, like, oh, you're right. Two minutes later, you're all right. He's not. When you fall yourself, you bloody know how hard it hurt you. Do you know what I mean? And that's where you're going to talk from, that experience. So always make sure. Um, yeah. There we go, guys. <laughs> Okay, so guys, we've got 15 minutes, um, and if I was in your position, then I would ask any question that I have in my, my brain um, and make use of this time. You can ask me anything about starting new businesses, um, any of the habits, or any thoughts that you have. Hey, uh, so part of the beginning of your journey, um, when you were having any thoughts, you know, whether to buy from this or whether to buy from this and what's best. How did you go about overcoming that? Because sometimes you know, the more you reach, the more you can kind of discourage yourself because you find a lot of negative stuff there, you know. So sometimes it's because it's also when you if you only have like an amount of money that you have saved and you kind of want to put that forward, you want to be sure that it's not kind of wasted or you know what I mean? Yeah, of course. Um, again, I want to say to you that I, I, I was very fortunate that when I was in my dad's shop, um, I saw two sets of accounts. I saw um, a Barclays account and had about £4,000. A lot of money back in the 90s. I thought that was pretty amazing. And uh, I saw a NatWest account and it had £70,000 in there. I'm like, Dad, what's that? And he goes, well, we bought that butcher shop once we got a little bit of savings on the shop and we put that deposit there and we bought that shop as well. Then two rents come into this account. So already in my head I was like, that makes more than that. And you're never there, you're seven days a week here. What do I want to do? Do I want to be a shopkeeper or do I want to be a property guy? So I already knew going into property was very lucrative. And the second thing was I didn't have any bad habits. I didn't smoke, I didn't drink too much. I mean, sometimes we all have a little drink. There's, there's a balance, you know, you've got to keep it to a good balance and manage your habits. So. Just by not smoking and drinking, you probably save up the best part of 100 pounds a week, 400 pounds a month. 
just buy them small little habits. How much was the mortgage? The mortgage was five hundred pounds, and the rent was a thousand pounds. So it's covering. I said, well, if I just get six months of rent in, it's covering me for the whole year. The rest is just a bonus, it's free money. You know? okay, that's how. That's how I just sort of uh, for this sort of business. Go in here slowly. Don't jump in both feet. Because imagine you get burnt. Are you ever going to want to start a business again? You don't want to lose that security. You say, all right, let me start it from a side hustle. Let me see if I can do this online. Let me see if I can do this in the evening or weekends. Or the main thing like I did, well, I'm still working two jobs. Why have I got that property? So if it's empty, I'll get at least two, three grand from my parking job. I can cover that three, four, five times over. I don't have any bad uh, debts. I haven't got credit cards. I haven't, I haven't got a... Um, this sort of feeling of I need to buy material items, so that is real confidence. You know, keep your money to invest in your future, because some people would say to you, oh, "It's cruel to spend your young years like this. You shouldn't be doing that. You should be having fun and raving." Hey, hang on, I did have fun <laughs> on a Friday night. I would go out with my, my friends, but you know, we're making smart decisions. We're going around his house. We're going to have some drink around his house, or they come around mine. And, or at the end of the month, we'll do something. You'll save up for that sort of opportunity, but you don't have to just sort of spend all of your money and then say, oh, at least I had a good, good younger life of mine. No, that's the wrong way. You shouldn't be doing that because you have more energy right now. I'm 36. Can I do what? Can I replicate my journey? Maybe, but I'll be really tired of doing that right now. Right now, I'm 36 and I, I'm not into a room. And my value is three, four, five hundred pounds an hour for me to talk and to give some value to another person. So that's the position you want to be in and have financial freedom and your time on your side. Because now I've got until 80, at least, like an average man lives up to about that age. And you can do stuff on your terms. So the main thing answering your question is just make sure you don't leave all your security and just jump straight on the other side. I always like to transition. Even when I started um, the building work at 26, I still worked in McDonald's four days. So the days that um, I didn't have jobs on, I was just on my manager, do you really run in? Yeah, sure, you've always got space coming. And I always make sure there was some sort of income coming while, you know, a security. You know. So, if I can ask one question. Go ahead. What would you do today? Um, I think now it's a little bit more difficult from my perspective, but um, yeah, yeah. you know, what you would do today. You could be right, you could be right. The prices are different. You know, it's all about taking your earned income, putting it into assets, and creating that passive income. But how do you do that when the price of assets have really gone away from where wages are today? So what I'd say to you is, I work like a donkey, right? like a workhorse. I work for three pounds an hour, lifting stuff, scanning stuff, putting stuff down. We didn't have technology back when I was sort of, it's not advanced as it is now. Right now you can buy something off Alibaba, just put it back on Amazon, or a five pounds marker. You can go to sleep, put some good marketing advertisement, you can wake up in the morning and So, on my first property, I actually bought it as a residential and I went to live there myself. So I've done all the painting and fit the kitchen and um, yeah, then I, I did get in love with the neighbour. So I ran for the mortgage company and I said, um, now I've got a residential mortgage, I'm not going to live here anymore. Uh, what do I need to do? And they just said to me, you need a permission to let. I said, how do I get one of them? They said, sign this form, send us a cheque for £295. And uh, yeah, we can uh, allow you to rent it, and then at the renewal, we'll change it to a proper buy to lay. That's it. So, were you actually a little bit more involved into fighting to uh, rent to rent afterwards? Or? No. So, rent to rent is basically when you, let me just explain, some people don't know what rent to rent is. So, another easy way to get into property without any solicitor cost, any um, stamp duty, or any of the high deposits, you can just rent somebody else's house, 
if they're not on trend and maybe a deposit, maybe spend about a thousand pounds on furniture, make it look good, take some really nice pictures and put it on like Airbnb or Booking.com. Um, and then somebody will use that as a hotel. So they're like, why can I pay £150 for one hotel room? Or they might be fully booked in a special area when I can have this two bedroom flat for £150 a night. But the numbers work like it ends up getting you about four and a half thousand. And if you rent it off someone else for like two and a half thousand, you make about two thousand pounds. Um, for me, I didn't really go that route because my money was being earned in the bank and in McDonald's. And then as soon as I left the bank, I started working uh, as a builder myself. Something I did do, I did uh, I did take rooms off my dad. So my dad had one building, and uh, he said, "Ah, oh, this place keeps going up for rent, and then it keeps dropping over." I said, how much do you want? And he said, 1600 was the market. And I, I already had one house and I did room by room. And I said, I'll give you 1600 pounds. And I ended up renting it for two and a half thousand. So making 900, a couple of hundred, two, three hundred was bills. And I made about six, seven hundred pounds a month. So that's one thing I did do. And I ended up having another 50 rooms in Stratford. And there was University of East London there. And so I always knew the students there would need a place. And uh, during summer and Easter, you know, people would go back home or they wouldn't want to rent for the summer period. So then you would, you would think, ah, oh, there's this site called Airbnb. It was quite new back then. And I used to put it on there, and people used to pay 140 for two or three nights. And that was really big because I was like, I just need to get to the 500 number. So once I got it rented for like two or three nights, it covered the 500. I'm like, I'm okay for this month. And now it's about next month. So whatever I get now is a, you know, a little step up. So what was the percentage of your negative experience in that area? In, okay, with the rent to rent. In a rent to rent. Uh, the negative period is only if you have a room empty. So you need to do your due diligence, like in terms of, hey, am I in a prime location? Let me try and book a hotel room in the area. Let me see how easy that is. If they're always fully booked, then you know that's the area in demand for a start. Um, so you just got to, uh, there are the main things if you lost one month of a room, that's it, it takes really long this out, really. Um, but I mean, it, have you had any issues, you know, in terms of tenants um, not paying the rent or, you know, destroying the house or stuff like that? Yeah, so I, I used to tell my cleaner to make sure we check on the communal areas. I said, look, if there's any issue in the communal, like the bathroom or the kitchen areas, can you please let me know? Um, because I'd like to fix it sooner than later. And even there was times, you know, one of my cleaners was like, hey, someone's sleeping on the sofa and I don't believe a tenant. And I'd go in and was like, who's let their friend in sort of thing. So the cleaner will definitely help you. Make spot checks once a month yourself also. Uh, and of course you get tenants who don't pay. You know, it becomes part of the business. But this is why you don't have money in the account, you don't spend it all. If you made 600 pounds, you leave it in there. That's your business. I'm getting my own income from here, I'm spending that. Always keep, you know, all your eggs, don't put all your eggs in one basket, keep them separated, let money build up. If sometimes there's one room that's empty, it's eaten up into your profits. You look at the end of the year, I should have made 6,000, but two months was empty, so 500, 500, I've made 5,000 profit. Overall, you make money, so don't get too emotionally attached. Always look at it like a portfolio and an average. Um, what would be uh, your guidance for someone who is looking into, uh, you know, trying to get a side hustle or uh, make some extra money on the side? Um, would it be something to focus on what they already know and get creative uh, because there aren't very obvious, you know, uh, solutions or side hustles out there right now in their niche? or go into something that is popular and you see that it's proven, it's working, so spend some time on learning how to do that and get into that. What would be your advice today? I suppose you've got to look at the numbers and you've got to see if I did uh, go into the space I want to, how lucrative is it, how many other people are doing it, and what sort of money is it? are you going to earn from this. I know one thing, if you're passionate and inspired by what you like to do, it never feels like work. So for example, if you like making jewellery and you put beads together, you're never going, when is it five o'clock and I'm gonna stop working and you're gonna do it until you finish it. So you put your heart and soul into it and you can make that dream work because you'll be just as good as everybody else in the market. You don't mind working in the evening or weekend. So you can sort of take that passion 
But if it's like a proper leap of faith, like I'm going to be Vincent Van Gogh and nothing's happening right now, but I'm going to keep doing it, then that should be like a hobby. And then you need to go and make sure you're getting that bread and butter in. You've got to make sure the bills are being paid, the rent's coming in, and you can pay your rent and all your bills are being paid. Because the last thing you want to do, you're passionate, and then you rush your, your room and then you can't pay your bills and then you've got into debt, then that's you're spiraling out of control. You need to do that as a side hustle and then put that on eBay or, or um, one of these other platforms to see does my painting sell while you're actually doing the real stuff. And, once, and always try to be smart with your money. So when you're saving money, you always have money for a rainy day and a little buffer. So if you do make a mistake, you have a backup. Not, I was living from paycheck to paycheck. And now I have no other option. Now I'm high and dry. That makes sense? Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so basically do your research, see what's working, and then try to get into that. Yeah, I mean, always do what you're passionate about. Always do what you're inspired by. But make sure that's a hobby for you. So make sure that's you know one two nights a week that you're doing what you want to do. But you know I didn't want to work in McDonald's. I didn't want to work in Barclays. But today I'm doing what I you know, what I wanted to do. I'm talking to people. I'm helping people. You know I don't have to worry about money. So today like now I can live the rest of my life like this. So just just balance the risk. Life is all just about how much. If I if I put my heart and soul, it doesn't work. What's my backup from there? You've always got to just make sure. We have also some online questions. Okay, cool. Um, as we're moms and <coughs> as we're students, we don't have enough money to buy any kind of property. So where can we invest or what kind of asset we can buy, especially as an international student? Yeah, that's a tricky one to be an international student. Um, so as the lady up there, uh, mentioned earlier on a rent to rent could be possible all you gotta do is impress an agent or a landlord and say look this is who i am i'm allowed to work here uh, this many hours would you mind if i rent this property from you and you know this you might need to give an extra one or two months more deposit just in case that landlord wants uh, security or safety but um, I'm not quite sure on the rules and regulations of where this person's from, this student from, or what they are allowed to do here or not. Yeah, so it's a little bit tougher than to ask uh, I would need to do more research on that, if I'm honest. How did you effectively manage mental health working seven days a week? Yeah, so a lot of people ask me this question, and you know, they talk about burnout and how did you hack it? Well, my mindset was always, am I doing enough? That was always what I was saying. I was like, I'm going to get there, am I doing enough? I'm doing this place, I'm doing that place, I'm doing that. It was always that thought did not leave my head. Am I doing enough? No, I'm doing too much. Anyone can feel sorry for themselves. As soon as you say, I'm doing too much, that's it. You're going to say, I'm doing too much. Your emotions are going to become your actions. You're going to live that sort of life. So it's how bad do you want it? If you want it, you can have it. Just say to yourself, this is not hard. And tell yourself the opposite thing. That's in my opinion. I'm not saying it from a GP or a scientific sort of way, but in my mind, I kept myself busy. Um, I also went to places like the gym in between. You know, three years ago, I competed on stage in bodybuilding, fully shredded, and it was again that same mindset. I'm going to follow that diet, I'm going to follow that training regime, and I'm just going to keep following it. You can do anything you tell your mind to, I believe. Unless you've got a proper serious mental health illness that a doctor sort of diagnosed to you, you know, everything's hard. We all feel lazy. We all, if so many times I've got home 10 o'clock from the bank and then in the morning 6.30, I'm like, I don't want to do this, but I've just got to say, where do I want to get to? Because if I miss today, I'm not getting 800 at the end of the month, I'm getting 700. And that's going to be, a, that's taking me another month away from where I need to get to. No, I ain't going to do that. I want to get there even faster. So, this is about you and the thoughts in your head of what you want. You drive that. You're always in the driver's seat. You can decide whether you want to go faster or slower. I always want to get there as fast as possible. Would you grow my internships for students like us and help us in growing? Well, I, I put um, a lot of stuff on uh, social media. There's over 500 reels on TikTok. There's 
Instagram Reels that we put on. We've um, just started a new series called Back to Basics. So, you know, I've made it really simple how to do your CV, where to get that from, where to look for jobs, how to do some interviews. Um, I show you what I do on my weekend, or go to the gym, meet influencers, where we eat, eat doing mentoring calls. So, there's some stuff on YouTube there also. And if you just go to the channel, there's the podcast where I conversate with other business people. So people say, your network is your net worth. And some people go, well, I don't have these sort of people around me. Well, I interview millionaires all the time or successful people. Um, actually, I'm going to let you in. Like on Friday, I'm going to be interviewing a guy called uh, Conversation of Money. He's his channel, Peter. And he started a Cobblers. He worked in banking, became wealth management, and now he's high flying in his own business. He's been on national TV. So, you know, all these things are coming out. So, that's one thing I can offer for myself. Um, and it just depends on how big sort of the channel grows uh, for me to, to look at how else I can sort of give back and if there's any other employment that I can do. But at the moment, I'm not in that position. I've always been sort of a one man team and just contract people in and out. Uh, but I do try to provide a lot for you guys. So, whoever can follow all of the channel, Seanland underscore one. TikTok, Instagram, YouTube is called Sean Man. Just, just use up all of that, look for all of that content. On that reel, always ask me a question, Sean, I didn't understand that, or what you mean by this, or I have a question, you can DM me, check on the website, you can drop me an email, and maybe we can help you with that sort of side of things. Does anybody in the room have a question? Do you have a question? Are you sure? Yeah. You're pondering. <laughs> Any last? Okay, yeah. Oh, just one. Can I just talk about you on the first one, um, networking and creating connections? How important was that for you? And if you have any tips for us? Yeah. So I'll be honest. I'm into a situation that we are not native English speakers. That's um, not the problem. Never let, yeah. let, never let anything be a barrier because it's us who put in barriers in our head. It's not really there. I've, I've never once thought that. You're not from here, or you've, you're, you're at the whole room. You've asked me the most questions, also, you know, and you've added a lot of value to, you know, myself giving a presentation and to other people listening to what you've asked. So never let anything like that be a barrier, because I think sometimes we put that on. Um, networking. Up until the last two, three years, I didn't network at all. Did I wish I networked? Maybe ten percent. I wish I networked. But one thing why I didn't like networking is I hated fake promises. I used to hate meeting real estate people and saying, oh, hi, um, yeah, I'm interested in buying this uh, big building here. Yeah, I've got property already. Yeah, I'm going to give you a call. Can I view it? Yeah, I'm going to. And then after, I'm like, I ain't funny for that. You know, why was I even talking to him? I hate it. <laughs> I hate talking rubbish, you know? Um, and that's what I found out a little bit about networking. And sometimes I feel, even I go to places and I just see a lot of fake people, you know, they, they, this is my title, I'm the blah, 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 blah. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? Obviously, the receptionist. Okay, cool. Like, why have you got to give me this big title to, to, to think you've got confidence in this room? So, sometimes um, networking can be not the best thing, but at the same time, if you see an influencer who you like out there and talking about a certain subject that you like to learn about, and he's got like two, three hundred people attending, then hey, you might meet your next business partner there because you're like-minded. These people are there to, to listen and learn about what you want to learn about and you might be able to even have someone who you can talk to and text message and go, you know, I found this deal, you know what we talked about at the seminar, what do you think of this? And you know, we might be in totally different areas, so I'm not interested in the same sort of properties. That's just property, for example, but networking can never be bad. Because if you've got a problem, you can pick up the phone, you might have somebody in that list, in that area that you can call, and it's not a problem anymore. But make sure you're not giving any false hopes to anybody, because remember, you've got to be accountable. You don't want someone giving you two emails and three calls, and you know, you know we spoke at that seminar, you said you wanted this, now I've got it. Now I've got it, like, do you want it? Like, it's exactly what you asked for. And you're like, well, I got 30,000 there to complete like, this transaction. Then you don't want to, like, I think your brand is everything, you know? You, you are a walking, talking brand. Like, one of my first managers, one of the second managers in Barclays, Andy Green, uh, 
for that concrete example. So um, I, um, there was this insurance. I was number one in West End and third in the region. And there was this insurance um, where you needed this big, heavy, duty lock to, for this insurance to work. And I didn't believe in it. Because I'm like, who's got that bloody big chub lock? Because I asked for you people, they go, no, we just have a normal key lock or a latch. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I got at my house. So yeah, it's eight pounds a month. But if you get robbed, they're going to check that lock and you've got that lock so the whole insurance is invalid. I said, I'm not selling that. So I went and said it again, so it's like, yeah, mortgages, yeah. The target was two, you've got four, well done. Uh, financial um, advising leads, oh, you've got two pensions, you've got some one, two invest. Oh, your target's £250,000 savings, oh, sure, you've done a million, well done. Oh, your GI, your general insurance, that's all down, isn't it? Yeah, it's just one area, but I don't really believe in it. No, 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 we need to work on this, Sean. We need to get this up. So look, I asked the question, they say they don't have the trouble. Out. And they almost was like, we don't need to ask them really we're lost, you know, like, just, we need to sell these. So no. So they put me on a pick, which is called a performance improvement plan. And I got really, like, you know, like when a, a little boy is told off and, like, dragging his feet, like, not doing this anymore. That's exactly how I felt. I'm not doing this. So I was like, yeah, my savings target is 250,000. Yeah, here you go, 260,000. Oh, yeah, you want uh, financial advisement or, 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 or mortgage leads? There you go, there's two digital bare minimum that you need. And then my uh, manager called me to the room, Andy Green, and he goes, Look, Sean, I said, What's the issue? I'm doing all the targets. Yeah, but you normally know, hold up the whole branch with your targets, you normally know, make up for the other people. Yeah, I'm on a pip in it. I'm on a pop, pop, performance improvement plan. And he goes, Let me take a I can't take a seat. And I was sat with him and he goes, I know you're better than this. Remember your brand. Brand was brand. He goes, When you're walking down the street, you want to see that short lad over there, that guy, 100, like, he's got it. You don't want no one person looking down on you. This attitude, how long is, how far is it going to take you? Yes, you're performing, but you can do better. Don't let this one thing upset you. Don't want to hurt your brand. He said, do you want to be an Argos or do you want to be a John Lewis? But you know when you go to Argos, Argos, you're like to fight two for nil to get a refund. With John Lewis, they're happy to give you a money. Oh, even then, oh, yeah, you broke that. There's no, yeah, we're happy to give you a refund. But this is why everybody goes to John Lewis, because they know they're going to get 100%. So what do you want to be in my Marcus or the Marcus or John Lewis? So always, yeah, always, what was the question? Sorry, I could be a real ta a story tag, okay. Yeah, um, story. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so I just say always just worry about your brand and the best you can be. And don't worry about anything else and you know, put things will leave. And like money you use might really make it. In life, and then you might say, Hey, <laughs> like I still want to be a small guy, and you might say, Hey, he came and inspired me one day. I don't know how many seeds I'm planting, but something might go somewhere. So that's the trail you want to leave behind you guys. Okay. Okay. Nice.